Okay. Nice and quiet in here, down in the dungeon. Uh, the extension of the wet lab, which is otherwise known as the laundry. Um, I often use this as a temporary bench close to the water supply here. And if I spill something not toxic, um, it just drains off into the wash and flush it out. Um, nothing here is toxic. A little bit of high voltage, nobody yonder. Not right now, but that is something I have to be careful of. You don't want to hear how warm is that? <coughs> no. Not happy. Anyway, um, this is about something I have been pondering. Oh gosh, since the it's 1970s, in a sense. Um, as a kid, I always wanted to make batteries. Well, you know, I didn't have any money to buy them, so I would use some chemicals. Well, I didn't have any money to buy chemicals either, so you used what you had, salt, uh, baking soda, borax, uh, salmonic, you know, you know, you get your hands on. Um, I've made batteries work from Epsom salt. Um, so I've always been fascinated by that. Um, and something recently got me keyed again on it. Um, I was just tooling around on uh, YouTube and there's, there's a couple of people that are out there demonstrating uh, how electrolytics, uh, electrolytic capacitors function. You know, how, when, how, what exactly, how do they work? Um, uh, a lot of pretty knowledgeable engineers I've worked with have really no idea um, how they do. Uh, I could get into that uh, real description of that right now. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube about it. Um, and elsewhere. It's not that difficult to find. I'll elaborate some later, but uh, for now, we're kind of doing this backwards. I've already got this set up. I've already, I, I know it works. Uh, been running it. I've been actually been playing around with this for about a week or so. Um, it's figuring out, well, what's the best way to do a quick and dirty demo? Well, there is, is you know how these things, they, they look, it blooms into more than you uh, initially anticipated. So, and that's uh, typical uh, of this kind of shit. Oh, stuff. Pardon me. Um, what we're looking at is an electrolytic cell here. Um, electrolyte, obviously, some liquid in there. Um, it's not toxic. I can eat that. You know, if you got a sour stomach, it'd help. Um, two plates of aluminum foil here. One here, one here. And a cheap Chinese made stainless steel spoon with the handle stuck down in there. Um, oh, we'll get into why this is set the way it is later. Um, but what this is intended to be is a full wave rectifier made essentially from two electrolytic capacitors all in the same cell. Um, I've got, you. they're used to uh, be, in fact the earliest uh, methods of, of rectification, AC, turning AC currents into DC currents, uh, work electrochemical. Um, the earliest, um, some of the early, among the earliest uh, uh, detector diodes and uh, radios, uh, radio receivers uh, were electrolytic in, in nature. Um, cumbersome, but they did work. Um, so th this is a full wave rectifier, not a, not a half wave. Um, and for this arrangement to work, I have an AC power supply here. It's just a transformer. Uh, 120 volts in, and it it has four seven volt taps. Um, I've got it configured so it puts out 28 volts with a center tap. So it's 14 volts between one end to center and 14 volts from the other end to center. Um, and that with two, essentially two diodes, two polarized capacitors, they're gonna function as diodes. Uh, this will rectify full wave and I've got a couple of loads here. I chose motors. I could have put a resistor here and just measured current and threw it. And, but um, this is not very exciting watching a resistor warm up. So I got 
so this blower here that's a 12 volt blower 12 watt blower and this is a motor out of a battery powered um, string trimmer uh, also known as a weed whacker um, and this motor just kind of yeah, got a little dodgy so it, it, it got, got scrapped to save the motor these, these pull some current and they'll turn at low voltages too uh, this it's not going to see 12 volts here but it will there's enough there enough current available that it, it will turn it so initially I'm going to start it and um, these two loads this motor and, and this blower are not connected I just clip lead them on there when, I'm, when it's ready uh, these here these are process controllers I have a bunch of them um, they're really handy uh, they're kind of universal. This one's programmed set up to uh, read temperature. There's a probe in here. There's a little platinum 100 ohm RTD probe to measure temperature. So, and that's in obviously degrees centigrade. The top display. The bottom display is the set point. I just got it set to the maximum range that I've got these programmed to. This is 100 degrees centigrade. This is reading volts DC. Uh, more about this reading right now in a second. Uh, Maximum range on this is I set it to 10 volts, 0 to 10 volts, and uh, a current meter. This one right now, there's no current flowing, zero, and uh, the maximum range on this is 20 amps. Um, this here is the uh, shunt resistor that I'm using to sense current. Uh, the input to this is uh, maximum. It, the input I'm using is a maximum 10 milliamp, and uh, to give you an idea, it's just a tiny little sip of current coming off of this. I'm sorry, 10 millivolts. Tiny little sip of voltage coming off of this bridge. Uh, bridge this uh, shunt uh, to, to get current. And these are traceable, uh, calibrated. And this, I got minus 620 millivolts or so across this. So keeping in mind that this is an electrolytic cell, and because I'm using dissimilar metals, there will be some galvanic action here and that's that's what we're seeing here so this essentially is acting like a battery now, it's interesting the uh, current flowing into this meter very very low the input impedance to this is 20,000 ohms it's just the way I have it set up um, that, that current's also flowing through one of the sides of this well, actually both sides of this transformer to here uh, to get through to the voltmeter yeah, interesting. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave the loads off. I'm going to um, apply power to this. Um, what you're going to see is, since this is already formed, it's going to begin rectifying immediately. This will go positive and, and come up. Um, and you'll see a value here, maybe a little, jumping around. Uh, this is tied to... It's, it's set up for measuring uh, current in amperes. So this is, uh, well, it's displaying it in milliampere. So it's, you know, if you see a digit here, that's an amps point something, something, something uh, amperes. In other words, this thousand here is one amp. And, and that's connected between one end of this and uh, one of these plates. Uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of currents that, that AC currents that actually flow through this without any load DC load being uh, connected to it sorry to ramble on so much pardon me I'm trying to keep this brief the batteries in this uh, camera here are elderly all right here we go just watch the ammeter there and uh, watch what happens with DC volts and it goes Okay, so we've got DC volts already. Um, that's appearing on the spoon here. That's our common anode, two cathodes. Um, 1.28 amp being drawn from the outside of the secondary of this. It's actually a little more net because there's current flowing through the center tap too. 
I could have set up another one or two of these to capture all that. Don't have time. This is enough. So, 1.2 amps is flowing between this foil and this foil. Both of these are cathodes, so each is willing to give up electrons, but not willing to receive it so much. But even so, there's still capacitor, so it's it's like taking an AAC capacitor and putting it across an, a, an AC source or a AC rated capacitor and putting it across an AC source. The current is going to flow. AC current is going to flow. And that's what's happening here, and that's what you're seeing there primarily. Um, there's no current being drawn from the anode, and uh, just sitting here, no no load. So about nine and a half volts. Also, this temperature, uh, this electrolyte will warm. It has resistance. Currents are flowing through it, and it will fizz. It will, uh, you know, there are gases evolved, hydrogen, oxygen. Uh, evolved from this. Um, there's a couple of minor mistakes I made with this construction here. Um, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate uh, when we tear this apart uh, shortly. Uh, you, you know, keep an eye. Watch this. 19.7 right now. You'll see it through this. This will begin to climb. It's already doing it just from the current, the AC current flowing between these two plates. Um, once you start drawing some current out of the anode, um, more currents are going to flow, and this is going to this rate of rise is going to increase. Uh, this is going to drop with a load, and you'll see how much current we're getting out, and you'll see this increase too with with the load. So let's see, make this. I'm trying to run out of time here. Let's see. I think first load we'll put on is this blower. I think. Uh oh, I did something wrong here. Hold on. Oh. Pardon me. I'm losing my mind here. Definitely. Okay. Pardon me. Troubleshooting time. You notice this stuff gets you at the worst. Oh, I see what happened here. Okay. Current here. This has to go here. It fell off. Pardon me. Insufficient wreckage. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so let me wrap this a little bit more securely. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. Okay. So that's just this running. Um, it's drawing 400 milliamps and it's pulling the supply down, rectified output down to about six and a third volts. Um, you know. It's drawing 1.3 amp now, 1.38 amp now, uh, from the outside secondary of this, disregarding any current flowing through the center tap, and there is some, just not capturing it right now. And now we can connect. Also, this. String trimmer motor, which is obviously turning. You can hear it. Uh, yeah, 1.5 amps and uh, 1.52 or so amp AC from the outside leg to this. Almost an amp, 0.9 amp, coming from this anode. I gotta be real careful with that. Um, that four and a third volts, and you can see this is coming up the temperature a little bit. And you know these are these numbers will wander around. There's things happening in there. It's uh, you know, it's a, pretty, a lot of gas coming off of that. 
Uh, nothing toxic. Uh, explosive if you concentrate it, but don't. Uh, it's incidentally as um, you are operating this, it's producing HHO gas. And I know there's some people that are it's ecstatic about that. So maybe while you're using a rectifier such as this to charge your battery bank, um, you collect the HHO and use that for your car. I don't know. Um, another aspect about this, as it heats, uh, well, several things happen. It, it becomes more conductive just by virtue of that it's hot. And also, as it heats, there's some extra um, undissolved uh, material down laying in the bottom. And as it heats, that will begin to dissolve into solution and keep the uh, keep the solution in saturation. Um, so that's yeah, pretty much what it is. I'm going to put the brakes on this string trimmer motor and uh, just watch what happens. Okay, right now, idling. Everything here is a blower. The motor. It has cost four and a half volts at about 0.9 amps. Drawing 1.6 amp. I'm going to stall this. And yeah, you see the AC current went up a little bit. 1.6 to 2. This is hogging all the voltage. So that stopped. 1.7 amp. Still pumping. You know, a little over. Yeah, I'll call it 1.2 volts. 1. Point, yeah, 1.2 volts. 1.7 amp. This producing much more gas. <laughs> Gases. Let it go, and she'll pick up again. An interesting thing happens. It seems to have stripped some material off of either the anode or maybe the cathodes, where and it changes the performance. And once you cycle it like that a few times, it kind of settles back the way it was. But early on in the uh, forming of, of these aluminum uh, plates, um, it, it's, it's odd. You know, you draw the excessive current for a while, you let it go, and it um, important important performance improves um, very noticeably. From it. I'm not suggesting there anything free energy here at all. I don't go there. Um, and I'm not suggesting at all that this is a practical uh, solution. Oh, no pun intended. It's not necessarily a practical um, application of this electrolytics. Uh, but uh, yeah, I guess it's more of a demonstration of, of what can you know, what can be done. Um, I'm going to pretty much clip this here and section it out. I, I'm going to have to put new batteries in this camera. Um, and um, the next thing will be I'm going to, well, just showing it, did uh, capturing it. I'm going to disassemble this and uh, make a new one and start over from start over from, from scratch, and um, while well, keeping all the monitoring stuff handy. Um, and you yeah, have one thing it's it's anybody can do this if you have um, this here which you do in the kitchen uh, but it does take a uh, center tapped uh, power system of AC uh, current more on that later uh, but for now I'm going to cut this off and the next thing uh, we take this apart and uh, let's see what the damage is so yeah Okay, uh, hmm. things cleaned up a little bit here, um, and we're gonna disassemble, disassemble uh, this cell. Uh, first, I thought maybe it'd be a good idea to um, uh, tell a little bit more about what these are. Um, this one temperature. Here's the probe. You can see it's reading 90.6 degrees centigrade Celsius if you like and I'm warming it and you can see it's rising okay it's just functioning as a, a temperature readout it's not controlling anything none of these are controlling anything these are just readouts 
um, this one set the volts here are, is the input um, I'm going to connect this up backwards uh, just to illustrate what happens it shows an alarm that's below one volt um, it, it gets capable of reading that I just didn't it's I'm not interested in bipolar operation so it's oh come on stick on all right and so this nine volt alkaline battery uh, with 20,000 ohms across it is uh, 8.7 volts it's still usable um, and this current meter the same thing if I hook it up backwards it'll do this it'll show an alarm um, oh gosh I, I'm gonna go ahead and hook it up one way or the other alarm okay that's backwards and we're gonna show what this 9 volt battery with essentially a dead short across it and I'm not gonna do this long uh, registers uh, amperes wise here 4 amps call it I wouldn't do that long these have a nasty habit of mm, misbehaving uh, when you draw too much current from them and sometimes that misbehavior is um, abrupt so anyway just to illustrate a little bit of, so okay so enough with that this what is it okay um this is just a plastic clamp to hold the anode in which in this case is just a cheap stainless spoon um there is some discoloration here however just with a mild wiping it seems much of it is it comes off this stuff now this is not toxic it is it's uh, it's innocuous believe me I'll show you what it is shortly yeah just kind of give this a little rub with the fingers yeah yeah there may be some change in the very surface of this uh, but it's subtle there's uh, there's no obvious pitting or anything uh, but there does seem to have been a a change in this uh, however subtle and there's a reason why I'm using this uh, but now <laughs> these aluminum plates electrodes um, got these plastic taped into the beaker just to hold them steady yeah so I think they're filled with electrolyte and uh, some of that has to do with the uh, mistake I, I made putting this together well, set that there and these are pretty much the same here's another you know kind of puffy and it's filled with electrolyte so I squeeze it Oop, squirting all over the place okay Um, we're gonna look at these more closely. Uh, go ahead and flatten these out and sit there. Uh, need that. Rinse this stuff off my hands. All the you know, crumbly, crystally stuff. Um, yeah, it's good for your skin right here. So I'm going to pour this out, um, we're done with this, and you can see some sediment down here, various things, 
and I'm just going to pour this out. Rinse it. Okay. What <laughs> that electrolyte is, well, why not? Oh. Yeah, let's go for it. What the heck? We can use this. This is a, you know, just a, not, not, not the same beaker we were just looking at. Fresh beaker. Rinsed. And wet. I'm going to add the magic ingredient in the most exact quantities. Um, this stuff. I'm just going to, you know, it's, it's very important to get this just so. So just psh, a little bit in there. Okay, that's good enough. Baking soda. Good old. Sodium bicarbonate. Stick a bunch in the bottom of the beer. That's all. Stick some down in there. Now this is a 500 milliliter container beaker. Use what you got. It doesn't have to be glass. It doesn't have to be labware. It could be a jar, a mason jar, a plastic cup. Doesn't matter. It will work. Just put some baking soda in it and uh, regular old cold tap water yeah to about being precise here but you don't need to 500 milliliters that's your electrolyte and if you get a little bit of acid stomach you can drink this it doesn't taste very good and, but I don't recommend drinking it after you've been putting aluminum metals in and doing electrolysis. You might get um, a little more aluminum or other alloys in that you don't want to drink. Um, I believe, trust me. Uh, but anyway, it, it's this. It's not going to burn you. It's not going to hurt you. And we're dealing with low voltages here, relatively low voltages here. Um, so. <laughs> that's our, our electrolytic tank, our electrolyte tank, or so. Um, oh, as I make the next one, I'm going to use a fresh beaker just because I need it to be dry so the tape sticks and then we'll just pour this solution into that um, once we've attached our new plates. Um, Mm. Pardon me. Rinse my fingers off. Okay, so these are the plates that came out of that other cell that we were just using. And it's very interesting that it's coming apart in these strips. Look at that. This is made of regular aluminum foil like you get at any grocery store. Um, and, but look how it has degraded in these strips. I think, now this, this side, this, this edge of this, this side of this plate was facing the center where most of the current would be uh, flowing. And that's what happened to it. And it's very interesting. It did it on the back too, but not as many of these fissures. And notice they're all in the same direction. Um, very interesting that. And there's nothing particularly special about the way these are made. It's just, just folded up a little regular kitchen aluminum foil. But I think 
that it is shredding the way it is. Uh, uh, I must mention, um, using these, it does consume the aluminum. Um, it may or may not consume the anode that you're using, in this case stainless. Um, I've used a number of different things, and I'll get into that a bit more later. But um, it's, it's very interesting, this it has deteriorated the way it has, specifically in this direction. I think that that has to do with the way the aluminum foil was produced, how it was rolled out, how it was extruded. Um, it may be worthwhile to take some of the foil I've been using and position it the other way during making these plates and see if it doesn't produce these sorts of things this way, which would actually be a bad thing um, because it would I mean, with this, each of these strands is still a cathode, fairly well connected to the body up here. If these were this way, they'd fall apart. They would fall apart and disconnect, and the resistance would be higher. Electrical resistance would be higher. I'm just thinking out loud. Oh, pardon me. So anyway. Um, these you can, there are marks on here. Um, pull this tape off. You know, all of this has gotten thin and sort of uh, brittle. As I said, it it does consume. Um, these aluminum plates inside. You know, there's some dark material in here. Yeah. These are the things, the reason why you don't want to uh, taste this after you've been <coughs> sending current through it with uh, metals. I guess some of this has ended up in solution, or will end up in solution in there. Okay, so that's one plate. This is going to be the same, the same thing, uh, pretty much. Okay. Pull this off. Pull this away. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. It's interesting that this sheet, this is just a piece of aluminum foil folded up. And the front sheet that took the most current did that. Separated into these long, it almost looks like tinsel. And uh, wrap it around to the back side. Pretty much the same thing, but it didn't break up into as uh, narrow as strands. But, uh, you know, probably given enough time it would, this whole thing would probably be reduced to something looking like that. Um, and because of that, it, it becomes flimsy in your electrolyte, and these things will move in there. There are currents, uh, not electrical ones, but physical fluid currents uh, produced by the uh, actions in there and it, it causes these so lightweight if this breaks loose it tends to toward the other electrode causes a short and um, it makes pretty sparks so anyway that's that's what happened to these and they were still working. I just uh, peeled them out because I want to you know, go ahead and start over from scratch and uh, show you just how stupid simple this is uh, to make uh, 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 in your kitchen. And uh, but 
And the caveat is, with, to do this exactly, you would need a center tapped AC source. Um, more on that in a bit. Um, expect a company in just a moment. Be right back. Okay. Um, get to the bit that's uh, rebuilding this electrolytic cell. Um, it's just a beaker I had been using. Empty, more or less cleaned out. It's not crucial. Um, this is already mixed. You see a layer of uh, baking soda down here. Uh, about 500 milliliters, not critical. Um, I'm going to set these aside down here in the sink. Bring this down a little bit. Good enough. And aluminum foil. These are uh, 12 foot long sheets. Well, roll. 12 foot wide roll. Nothing special about it. It's the thin stuff. You can get thicker for grilling purposes. That's the best way, probably. Something like that. And Notice on these foils that there's a shinier side and duller side. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I'm sure you can look it up. Um, but what I'm my thinking is that if it's dull like this, it's probably some etched or otherwise uh, this per square unit has more surface area. Yeah. I know when they build electrolytic capacitors and you know it, uh, they do purposefully etch uh, the uh, cathodes, the, the positive electrode, uh, the positive plate uh, to do just that, to, to increase the surface area and then uh, oxidize those it's like um, a plain versus a mountain range. Looking down on it, the mountain range has a lot more surface area than a plain does. Put three simply. Okay, so hang on. Um, I'm gonna make some plates real quick and dirty here. Let's try. I got a rule here. We're not gonna be measuring anything. This is just used as a straight edge, um, more or less. Eh. It's not critical. I don't need to trim off anything. I'm just going to put this here and you know, fold this over like so, or thereabout. A piece ripped off, doesn't matter. And just kind of flip this over once, twice, three times, I think it's thrice, four, eh. Let's go five. Five reps in there. Give us lots of layers. Uh, scissors. Uh, trim this off. Leaving about a half inch extra. Just uh, for convenience sake. Something like that. Hold that over. Uh, And uh, just kind of flip that off your rule. Whatever you use, you could use a, a painter stir stick. One of those work just fine. And then uh, flatten out. And fold it roughly in half this way. Get these two ends to meet up. Don't worry about that right now. Let's get these two roughly meet up. Bend it over. That's your crimp. That's where you connect your leads. See? And then you can clean it up, just do that. Okay? That's what I had been using as probes. Now, you may get some benefit to scrunch it up a little bit. Gives it some, it, once taped to the your jar 
speaker, whatever it is you're using. Um, you kind of tend to want to keep this up against the wall of the glass. And the reason for leaving this opening is that it allows the electrolyte passage, the free passage through there, uh, is thereby increasing the effective surface area. So, you know, you could make two of these. Now, one of the problems I had, and I did, I mentioned it as a mistake, and I should have known. Um, and by the way, these are flimsy if you pull it apart, just stick it back, grab it, who cares. Um, you could put a staple in there. Actually, that's not a bad idea. Staple that. <laughs> well, I'll not worry about that right now. Uh, but one of the problems with this, because it's a wrap, and the electrolyte will find its way in between these turns, and it will... Uh, gases will evolve in there. Yeah. And so what happened was that these blew out like balloons. Both, both th this whole thing, it blew out like balloons. Because the gases that were generated could not escape. So it caused these things to puff out and so spread and they, they were drawn to one another. And you don't want these two uh, cathodes to come into electrical contact other than through the electrolyte. The direct contact, bad, bad medicine. Um, arcs, sparks, way too much current in the machine. So it is crucial to keep these from touching. So um, what I'm thinking to do with these is to provide a vent somewhere mm, about there. And the way I'm going to attempt this, I'm just going to fold this over about like that. This is guessing. And I'm going to cut a pair of diagonals. A section out of this. Like that. Straighten this back up. And there we now have hopefully um, vent holes. Now I know using diagonals probably <laughs> squeezed the pinched, uh, but the, we're just going to leave it that way and see if that works, if that's adequate. If not, we'll figure out something else. This keeps coming apart here. Yeah, let's get that out. The fold, another fold, just like that. Lock that in there. So that's a plate. Um, I'm going to make uh, another one just to, well, not exactly, but as close as possible I can get to this one. Um, uh, I'll bore you with, with that. It's, I'll do that later. Uh, move on to how I'm attaching these. Um, essentially, I'm just, I uh, get it so it's maybe with this jar maybe three-eighths of an inch, uh, a centimeter or so off the bottom of the beaker. Pardon me if I get it out of camera. Um, and probably flatten this down a little bit, which will extend its reach. Something looking about like that. Get this to where you know, some space between the, the plate and the bottom of the jar. And uh, just kind of flip that over. And this is still going to kind of flop around in there a little bit. Uh, I might have to, once you get your bends in it, give it a bias so it wants to head toward the, the wall out of the glass. And then, um, uh, darn it, I, I left my magic tape uh, elsewhere. Um, all I'm going to do is take a piece of tape, take this from the inside all the way at the top, just hold this in place, just regular plastic tape, what, use what you got. 
yeah, it's not critical a little bit of space between the bottom of this plate and the glass um, not that that matters a whole lot but in the bottom of this there's going to be some set of it I'm not sure it's a good idea to have the bottom of your plates dunked into it I don't know um, so um, what I'm going to do I'm going to clip this um, I'll make the other plate just like I did this one get some tape tape them on and uh, we'll start uh, putting some current through and uh, take some measurements and, uh, you know see what's happening back in a flash